Hi, this is Stu Miniman with Wikibon on the ground here in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Work Bar. Thanks to our friend Matt Brender uh, from Basho. Uh, here with Chris Lind and George Nagel, who are developers uh, with, with a startup called Noodle. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for joining me. Thank you. So uh, you know, we're talking with uh, people that are okay, contributing, developing, using open source. Uh, first, can you just give me a quick background? Uh, you know, either one of you as to you know your jobs and you know who is Noodle. Sure. Yeah. So Noodle is a, an education search company. So uh, what Noodle plans to be is a single um, source for all of your education search needs. So if you are looking for pre-K, you come to Noodle. If you're looking for college, what college you need to go to, come to Noodle. If you're looking for um, post bac classes, come to Noodle to find those. All right. And what's the role of open source in, in, in Noodle's uh, ecosystem? It's kind of the, uh, the foundation of everything. I mean, you take a whole bunch of open source things, you put them together, and then you start building. You know, first it's a website, so you start. Uh, it has a you use uh, Django as the, the web framework um, to get you organized, and you make your website. And then you need a database, so you use Postgres and Mongo, and you need something for virtual machines, uh, so you use uh, open source solutions for all of those things. And then uh, a lot of what we do is web scraping to get data on courses and tutors and schools and what went out from a whole bunch of different websites. So we use an open source web scraping framework and then we put our cleverness on the inside of that. Um, and there's a whole bunch of work we don't have to do to get started. All right, so, so, so pretty basic question, but you know, why open source? Um, it's free, it's there, it works. Um, if there's a bug in it, you can fix it and move on. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I come from kind of the enterprise infrastructure world, and the old messaging used to be, oh, you know, what about open source? It's like, oh, well, it's free, and, you know, maybe there's not lock in, but, uh, you know, recent studies, especially over the last few years, it's really about, you know, you can get new features faster. Um, you know, there, there are kind of the speed to delivery is there, um, and, you know, you're not the only ones that, that are contributing to the code. Does, does that resonate with you? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, sometimes you have to put it in some thought before you pick like what framework are you going to use, things like that. And you have to take in, into consideration, does it have an active community? Um, if it's proprietary or open source, if it doesn't have a community of customers, then when you ask for help, you're not going to be able to find it. And when bugs are found, they're not going to get fixed. All right. So, you know, we're talking to lots of different types of, you know, users and contributors. You know, I don't think you guys are core maintainers of any projects Not necessarily. Maybe you are, but, you know, what, what, what's your role in the... In the I think we've both probably open sourced personal projects. Definitely. I've, I've certainly open sourced, like, um, little side projects on GitHub. Um, but less contributors to, to large... I'm, I'm less of a contributor to large um, open source projects. Um, yeah. Chris is a big contributor to Wikipedia, which in right. some ways, no, which I write content for, but I also have a bot. Um, and when you, like, if you have a project and you decide to open source it, you can get things back. Both other people um, adopting your project and using it, which I've had happen. Um, so you get you know the great satisfaction of helping someone out. Um, but you know, if you're trying to make money off of it, um, the other thing that you get is if other people are using it, they figure out what you've done wrong or help you maintain it so you get their help in return for a little bit of help for them yeah can, can you share the wikipedia is interesting what what what's the bot what's that do um uh, i used to have one that sort of helped out with uh moving articles between categories because it was you know when you decide all right we need to rename this category to that one there was a whole bunch of work you need to do to do that so if you go to all the articles and you know change it individually so that got automated um, my new ambition which i sort of started down the road on uh, is to find all of the typos and um, spelling mistakes in Wikipedia, like all of them, which is, there's like hundreds of thousands. And like, find them and fix them so I don't have to spend time doing that. Wow, well, so I mean, both those things resonate real much with me. I mean, Wikibon actually started out, we've had a wiki for eight years, mm -hmm. and taxonomy is such a tough one because uh, as taxonomy changes, the, the tree structure and, you know, pushing that down, boy, you could kill, you know, many cycles if you had to do that manually and even from an automated standpoint and stuff. And, Boy, spelling and grammar, I mean, grammar changes so often. We've got, you know, people from across the pond that, you know, your Z's and your S's and your U's, I mean, you know, it, it, it can become a challenge. We also, I mean, Wikipedia is actually an interesting open source of um, taxonomy because, like, we need to classify, like, our courses, for mm -hmm. example. So we use the category system there as a basis of 
and we don't have to do all the work of thinking of all of the things in the world that you could learn and figuring out how they put together. We can just say, it's done. If Wikipedia thinks it's that way, it's probably right. right. You saved a ton of time. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a one-to-one -one mapping either, no. but like you, you, know, you can take lessons learned from Wikipedia. They obviously spend a lot of time and energy doing what, you know, making yep. their structure. So we don't have to totally reinvent the wheel. Yeah. We also used um, what OpenStreetMap uses for their um, mapping system for our geolocation. So, um, you know, you can grab like census data and things like that from the US and put them together and make your own system. But they have the entire world. And if you find something that's wrong, you can go in there and, and fix it. And you don't have to put in all of the overhead of making that from scratch or pay for one from Google, which I'm sure would be awesome. Um, if, if you're just starting a company, like the, our startup got bought by Noodle and we had very little money. So it was kind of amazing how much we got done without, with a small team and without a ton of money mm -hmm. using a lot of open source solutions. Yeah, and in some ways it's the network effect that allows you to, to take advantage of, of, of those things. Yeah, I mean, I feel like once you've solved a problem like that, if, you open, if it's open source, then our civilization in general has kind of solved that problem and you don't need to have 10 companies solving it for themselves. Yeah, I mean, you're preaching the choir with me. Uh, Don <laughs> Tapscott wrote a book, Wikinomics, which was one of the foundations for what Wikibon was founded on. And he said, you know, t take Wikipedia for an example. If we took 0.02% of the hours that just Americans do watching TV, we create all of Wikipedia. And it was like, you, you think about that. It's like, I don't need, you know, everybody full time. It's just little slices, a tiny bits of all over the place we, we could do something with. Um, interesting trend, your company does, uh, you know, you think that, you know, some of the hottest trends out there, you think of the you know you know Uber and Airbnb or Waze. Um, they're not necessarily doing something brand new. They're taking some of the tools that are out there. They're using open source in many cases, uh, and they're putting together something uh, in, in a new way. So you know Waze is the example. It's like you know they didn't create the map. They you know created an app, but none of the ideas that they had were necessarily new. But they created you know a million billion dollars worth of you know value, I guess at least out in Silicon Valley, and, and were acquired for that. So that you know they cashed in. So um, it's interesting, you know, you talk, you know, Noodle, it's like, you know, there's got to be a million websites for education out there, you know, searches exist out there, but... Uh, if you Google for yeah. courses, you're going to have trouble finding them in a convenient way. I mean, the all classes founders were also very big on blowing up education and like, um, we were doing open enrollment classes, so it's like, with online education um, and the open content movement there happening, it's like, where is this going? It feels like something really big is happening there. And like the obvious thing is, well, is there a search engine for it? We could, you know, make that happen. So, so is, is the online education, things like MOOCs, does that help drive uh, some of what you're doing or to tie into what you're, you're working on? Uh, definitely. I mean, it's certainly a large portion of the, the course content that we're feeding in. Uh, I mean, uh, the idea was sort of, you know, if you were to do your undergraduate degree online or not as a one single bundle from one institution. Like, could you find all of the pieces? And like, the answer is, well, first of all, it's really hard to find all the pieces, much less get certified or, or anything like that. So the MOOCs are a rich source of content. They're also well organized. So from for data scrapers like us, we're like, yay, 10,000 courses all at once. Um, but you know, now we have to go out and find you know all the community colleges in the world, and now with Noodle, like all of the tutors in the world, and all of the preschools in the world. And everything. Okay, so to my understanding, Python is one of the main you know, projects that you're involved in, tools that you use, and, and the like. How long have you been using it? How did you get involved? You know, how 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 active are you? <laughs> so I've been using Python for about three years, and that's that's the main language I develop in. It's probably I spend about 90, 95 percent of my time developing in. Um, I started using it because I was looking for. Um, quick way to get up with uh, web project, side project, um, and I think Django Unchained had just come out, and so <laughs> I saw Google that there was this thing. open source project Django, and I, that caught my eye somehow, but um, yeah, so I've been working with that for about three years. Um, mm -hmm. Chris, you were using PHP before? Yeah, I mean, it kind of, a given organization seems to often adopt one language, and then everyone becomes an expert in that, so you do everything in that. Um, which works. So I was like at a PHP shop. I learned Perl before that, which transitioned very easily into that. Um, and then all classes, uh, I guess I was at uh, Raytheon, and then our group was using Python. Um, part of it is that 
Um, Python has a lot of open source libraries that are available, so if you're in a different language and you don't have them, it's not as easy. And also, like, the syntax is clean and it's fast, so you, if you're getting sort of the you know, feeling about which languages are people moving toward, Python is one of those, so that's Def also... Definitely, when you, when you mentioned um, network effects earlier, I worked at a previous job where we were using a language called Tickle, TCL tool command language. And um, you know, if, if you search for uh, an error message in Tickle, like you know, maybe you get 50 results. Maybe there's one example of how to how to go about this. But if you search for an error in Python, an error message in Python, there are like 50 posts on Stack Overflow of pe similar people who have had similar problems and like a bunch of um, different ways to solve it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's great having that community because you you solve problems much faster which is every what every engineer wants right? so, so so question for you your, your company is actually based in New York you guys are you know part of the Boston office here um, how much does locality matter for working in projects building a solution you know how, how do you guys collaborate on that do you know could, could you share a little bit of that well certainly github's a huge part of that right um, so at noodle we use github for our issue tracking, our, our project managers use GitHub to, to see um, how fast pro projects are being completed. Um, and, you know, GitHub, because so many people use GitHub, it has a huge uh, user base, like everyone's built tools to hook that up with, uh, for example, Slack, and um, which is our, you know, a messaging service we use. So um, it's, it's not a solved problem, but there are a lot of people working on it. Yeah. It, I mean, it still matters. I mean, when, when we started, people came up from New York, and if you meet them and go out to lunch with them at least once, um, we're going down to New York next month and meeting everyone there. I think it's important because if you try and do everything, like I was in a gray office by myself in a company of several hundred people, all in Cambridge, and we never talked face to face, we never made friends, so it just became prickly and unfriendly. Um, but I think so there's like a social function that needs to happen with people. Um, but you know, if you hang out on Skype, maybe you could do that if you try and do it a little bit more intentionally. Um, but certainly, I don't know, it, I'm a little worried that, you know, I'll be waiting for help and help will need to come from New York and um, I'll just be waiting around. But uh, so I'm happy that I have George here <laughs> uh, to ask questions and, and commiserate with, but, um, Almost all of the stuff you can do, you know, on the internet, because you're going to be on the internet anyway, right? Well, and, and we, when we were talking earlier with Matt about, um, you know, the sort of the infrastructure stuff, like, you know, we use we use Vagrant, we use Docker, and I've worked on other projects where, you know, I was working on. I think I was talking about this with you earlier. I was working on a, a Mac machine. My other person collaborator was working on a Windows machine, and getting those two environments set up, and we had like different layers you know, hideously stacked on top of each other so we could, you know, both collaborate with things like Docker and Vagrant, like these, these beautiful open source projects. It's a, it's a few commands and suddenly you all have like a common shared ground to work on and collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, one of the visions of Docker is to help separate kind of the application management from the infrastructure management. How, how does Docker, Vagrant, how do those kind of parse fit together? Are just two separate things that just help solve that problem overall, or is there, I, I don't know how those stack or fit together. Um, yeah, we just are in the process of setting up a virtual stack from mm -hmm. Noodle and, and uh, merging it with all classes. So um, if you have a, a virtual machine, like uh, virtual machines are kind of heavy and Docker containers are very light. Um, and once you get inside them, you can use something like Puppet, which we used to use, or Ansible like we're using now to say, you know, these files should be set this way and, and that sort of thing. If you need to like um, activate your VM or connect with it or manage it or share files um, with it, then something like Vagrant is basically the, the happy layer around either your VM or your container. It works with, with both. Um, so, or you can, you know, go directly around that, but it's it's another thing that will save you time, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel from scratch. Right? But definitely, we're. I think I think we're going to hand things off to our operations team after you know, like we'll we'll commit our code, 
push it to, up to the repo, and then you know it's up to the operations team to take the resulting Docker image and do whatever they need to do with it. Yeah. Um, in the past, we've done more of that work, and we weren't using Docker, and that's part of the reason why we were doing more of that work. Um, I think I think now we're going to be, you know, uh, delivering delivering the code and then have have a cleaner separation of structure. I mean, we also it all applies as we we're all on different operating systems, um, and so you'd want some predictability when you deploy to production that things are going to work exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So and we're in we were in the cloud and we still are we're, uh, with Amazon Web Services. So we basically took an, uh, an Amazon image and uh, used, uh, in that case, Puppet to configure it. And then we basically take that same thing and have a VM that runs on all of the developers' machines. So even though you know I'm on Linux, you're on Linux, it's like I want you to have exactly the same versions of all the libraries and the same settings that I put in mm -hmm. so that when I take that code after we've all tested it and put it out there, it doesn't go crash on deploy day. Um, and so. But I used to be pretty skeptical of virtualization because it's like the overhead and the sort of headache of having to get into a separate box. Just I'm already on the box. But it's like the headaches of there's something slightly different between you and me and I don't know what it is and we have to spend three hours figuring it out. Those are all gone and it's so much better. Yeah, if, you test, <laughs> if your tests run locally they'll, and pass locally, they'll pass in production, like they'll pass in your staging environment. Great. So, if people want to find out more about Noodle, is it you know available now? You know, what is the state? How do we find yep. it? What is Noodle.com? Wow, that that's good. That that's impressive. You get <laughs> Noodle.com. You don't get orders for like you know uh, you know soba noodles and stuff like that. No. I'm working for a spaghetti factory. That's what I tell my friends. <laughs> Excellent. It's probably much easier to explain to some of these people. But guys, I really appreciate you kind of unpacking some of this, talking about what the tools you're using, how you get involved, and open source. You know, big piece of helping a lot of startups. You know, grow fast, move fast, and meet their customer needs. All right, so Trojan Chris with Noodle, uh, thanks so much for joining and thank you for watching. Uh, lots of coverage of the open source movement uh, here in Cambridge, uh, throughout the company and the world, to lots of events with uh, the Silicon Angle and the Cube. Thanks for watching.